Tom, welcome to Halloween Daily. Thanks so much Hello. for hanging out with us today. It's great to be here. Yeah. I'm excited to talk to you. You know, we did connect briefly at age 45. It was too brief. And, and so now I'm excited to have this conversation because I think you've got an awesome story, having worked in this industry for, for many years on, on some amazing sets of some of our favorite movies and uh, right up to, to Halloween Kills, where you stepped in front of the camera, taking on an iconic role that we all know and love. So I'm excited to, to talk to you about your story. Um, before we even get into your career, though, and Haddonfield and all that good stuff, if you'll indulge us, because every day is Halloween, I've, I always try to learn a little bit about what the holiday might mean to you. And, and if you celebrate Halloween and and if you have memories of, of growing up celebrating Halloween or or um, or not, if that's um, been a part of your life. Well, uh, Halloween to me, you know, growing up, being a kid in the South, you know, it was always a dress up, whether it be a costume, a monster, a ghost, uh, you know, dressed in drag, whatever. Mm -hmm. You just go out and do it. And, you know, there'd be a little... Um, a little mischief involved as you got older we you know you take a couple of dozen eggs with us and egg some things and do toilet paper and um nothing too sinister yeah. but um you know get the candy always after the candy and stuff like that so uh you know it was a lot of fun i mean i can remember halloween pretty vividly uh, through the years and then um you know when when i got older it was usually a big party. Hey, so and so is having a Halloween party. So and then it was a big dress up thing, mm -hmm. and um, my wife and I would, you know, whether we were, I guess, before we were married and after we were married, we would dress up. And, and um, the most clever costume she had was um, they were printing. She was working on a film here in town, and they were printing um, uh, tiles for a like a bathroom floor, like uh, mosaic tiles, because okay. they had so much ground to cover, they just printed them on paper and glued them to the floor. And so she made this tile thing that was like made it into a costume, and then she put a toilet seat around her neck and then a plunger on her head, <laughs> and she went as a bathroom. And, uh, and then we went, and I think maybe the same year, I went as a closet where I had all <laughs> these different um, uh, clothes clothes hangers extended out with different clothes hanging on them. Anyway, you know, it's always fun. It's always gives you a chance to sort of uh, get out of the box and be creative. And um, I, th I think the older you get, it was more um, about sort of fellowship and less about um the uh the sort of horror part of it or the the scariness of it you know mm -hmm. it was more about the costuming and everything yeah yeah so yeah. it's been like, it really got good in 2018 though well uh, yeah i'm i'm sure that the holiday has taken on a slightly different meaning uh since 2018 and, but, and you know, i have to say halloween now. halloween is huge mm -hmm. This holiday of Halloween, yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, as innocuous as it is in Wilmington, you know, two or th a month out, people are decorating their houses mm -hmm. like way more than they do for Christmas or any other holiday. And I think, you know, sort of per capita spending, it's the largest outlay of of um purchases and mm -hmm. for goods and services than any holiday that there is mm -hmm. and it's you know technically not really a holiday as a holiday it's an event it's a memorial it's a mm -hmm. um it has got a life of its own you know it's it, a celebration it, it is and, and and it really is and it's it's like you said it's uh it's fellowship and it's community you know we've talked to people before oh, yeah. where it's it's a little more about community, whereas, you know, some of the other holidays, it's, it's about, you know, family stuff and, and or religious stuff. This is, it's more about the community. You know, it's, you're going out and, and, and being around your neighbors and stuff and meeting your neighbors in some, some case, uh, albeit in costume, but, you know, it's... Yeah. it's and, and I have to say with the, um, going to the horror conventions, 
the um, attendees are so into the art form. Oh, yeah. They are so invested and so genuine and so kind and gracious. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that kind of knocked me off my feet to begin with was how loving everybody was. And you think about, and you'll see a guy or, you know, whoever coming from a distance, big burly guy with chains and piercings and tattoos. And he walks up and he just kind of melts in front of you. Yeah. Oh man, I loved you in Halloween kills. And it was, and, um, it was just crazy. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. I, I had a, a kid come up. Uh, I was in um, Cincinnati at, it was called a horror hounds. And it was the, the end of the day on the last day where we're counting down the hours on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was the last hour. And this tall skinny kid comes up and I said, Hey man, how you doing? He says, I'm doing great now that you're here. And I said, really? He says, yeah. And so, um, we get to talking and he says, um, I want to do, I want to get a headshot and I want you to write a proposal to my fiance on the headshot. And so I said, will you marry me? And, but I, you know, I put my name on it, but he was going to give it to her mm -hmm. and he came back and, you know, we took our picture together and he says, this is the best day of my life. And where are you going to get that? Yeah. I said, well, that's a pretty good day for me too. And so anyway, that was like sort of uh, a, a capsule of the kind of stuff that happens, you know people and and the families will come from the father mother to the tiniest one will all come in costume sometimes in the same costume they'll all be dressed alike mm -hmm. and 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 do the um do the convention and it's just so um innocent and heartwarming yeah yeah it's really cool. but the horror fans are the best and the fans of this franchise like you said they're so passionate and it, it all comes from, from the heart, and we love Incredible. it, Incredible. They, they're so passionate. Yeah. Yeah. And I had people come. I had a guy come, and um, I did a film when I was just starting out in the business, uh, Trick or Treat. Yes, he, I, I wanted to, he, to ask you about that. He had a Trick or Treat poster, which are not easy to come by, and uh, had me sign it for him. So that was, that was a real treat. Yeah. That was great. Well... Before we get into, because I want to talk about that one too. I know that's one of your earliest um, projects you worked on. Before we leave the Halloween holiday, we always ask, and you mentioned costumes. What what is your favorite costume you've worn? And also, we always ask, what is your favorite Halloween candy? Well, my favorite. I dressed up as a Girl Scout one time. <laughs> I have to say that was probably my. Uh, I was probably ten or eleven years old. Mm -hmm. And my next door neighbor, or, or he lived across the street, he dressed as a, like an old um, hag. for oh, like, yeah. And his sister uh, had a, a Girl Scout uniform that mm -hmm. fit me. So we went out together as a Girl Scout and a hag. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And we threw a couple of dozen eggs while we were out. So <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. How about uh, Hall Halloween treats or Halloween candy? Well, my favorite is um, the, um, I'm a fool for a chocolate and peanut butter. I love a Reese cup. Yeah. And that's my, and now that they've started doing the dark chocolate, yeah. That's really got my number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, so I think that they started doing that just for Halloween. And now I think do them all the time now. So anyway, I've always had a little bit of a sweet tooth. I get that from my mom. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that. I, I hear no, that. Yeah. No, it's good yeah. stuff. And, and yeah, that, that something about that peanut butter and chocolate combo. Mm -hmm. It's, That's it's a combo. It's hard yeah. to beat. It is hard to beat. Yeah. And it's good for you. You know, some dark chocolate. Some peanut butter, you know, you get your fat, you get your, uh, um, through, uh, forget what there is, whatever compound you get from the dark chocolate. 
Mm -hmm. and some protein. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Keep you running all night. That's right. That's right. Keep you, keep you going. That's right. Um, so, so from there, like you mentioned trick or treat, and I know I was studying your IMDb today, and yeah, you worked on, like I said, some some sets of some really big iconic films. But the first one down there is the 1986 Halloween movie, one of my favorites, Trick or Treat, also filmed in yeah. Wilmington. Um, yeah. So, can you can you walk us through just? I mean, and you're there as construction foreman. If people don't know, I, I know yeah. some some of our viewers might just know you as Doctor Loomis, but yeah, yeah, we're talking about you're you're entering the business on the construction side. So can you talk to us a little bit about getting into it, into the business on as construction and then on on to uh, trick or treat? If you right. Well, well, I had um, I had a background in uh, residential and commercial construction. OK. Leading up to the. Um, the, the start of the industry here in Wilmington, um, Dino De Laurentiis, who was an Italian producer came here and did Firestarter in 1983. And at some, after the film was made, he decided he wanted to bring his company here. So he bought the property that they had rented during Firestarter on, um, it was like 23 acres of land. So he bought the property. It just had a single building on it at the time. And then they developed a plan to build sound stages. They started off with three sound stages and then four and five. And by the time uh, Dino, he, he went, um, the company went bankrupt, De Laurentiis Entertainment Group. I think they went under in like 1987. And by that time they built seven sound stages and several office um, complexes and we were at that time working. We there were always three films going on at the lot. So you would you might finish a film on Friday and start another one on Monday. It was like a factory. Wow. It, and and likewise, it was like an incubator. You were exposed to so much work mm -hmm. in such a short amount of time. And um, Dino had worked all over the world, so he brought he brought in different craftspeople, um, especially in like uh, plaster and paint and sculpture and to, to sort of, um, fast track the work. So they imparted all of that knowledge to the local crew. And so we were able to, uh, really get a lot of great experience in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I would say within a couple of years, um, we were kind of a full service, you know, filmmaking community. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and I, and I moved here uh, for that. My wife and I moved here uh, specifically to work in the industry. One of my friends that I had built houses with had gotten in on the ground floor with Dino and um, we moved down here from Asheville and I went to work first and then she came on as a, a scenic artist. She's got a master's in fine art. So she worked for a few shows doing um, scenic art. And then we started a family after that. But I, I kept on, you know, and it was the, the industry sort of, it would come and go. Dino went under and then uh, a year or so later, another company called Carol Co. bought it and they ran the studio for, I guess about seven years and then they went bankrupt and then a company out of New York bought it in an auction, uh, screen gems. And they just sold it last year to a sort of a, a international, um, outfit called Cinespace who has, uh, they've got, uh, studios and stages all over the world. So, um, you know, it's kept plugging along. It's had mm -hmm. some peaks and valleys, but, um, it has stayed, in the game, so to speak. And um, so, and likewise, um, the people who stuck with it have kind of been down the same path, you know? So that's been, um, uh, as I say, 40 years behind the camera yeah. and 12 hours in front of the camera. So, you were, the, so you were there right, right at the, at the beginning, basically, as, as like you said, when Dino first opened the studio that would later be Screen Gems. And, yeah. um, and, and where, did, where did you move from? 
We lived here from Asheville, North okay. Carolina. I was okay. living, uh, we were living up there and it was, um, I was working in you know, uh, building houses mm -hmm. and just kind of scratch out living between mm -hmm. uh, weather and, um, you know, and it was a little bit of a depressed housing market at the time. So there wasn't a ton of work and uh, we were looking for a change. Mm -hmm. So that got us here. And um, we, we said, well, we'll give it a few years and see how it works out. And so it worked out pretty good. We're here, uh, you know, we've lived, we've been here 40 years now this month. So, wow. yeah. Wow. So since 84. Uh, when we yeah. moved here, the only, th you know, the studio consisted of one kind of a warehouse slash office building. And then they, you know, started building stages one by one and kept adding and adding. And um, my second film called Year of the Dragon, we built um, three blocks of um, New York's Chinatown with full stores, sidewalks. Uh, and we went like four stories high. And um, that was like, you know, it sort of turbocharged every sort of learning experience. And, uh, and uh, um, once again, we had an international crew working on it. Uh, the whole construction management was from England and they were used to doing big shows. And, you know, we just fell in with them and learned the tricks that they taught us and um, kind of ran with it. So, so that was your second one. Was Trick or Treat the, your first, um, your first well, Trick or Treat was about my fifth show, I guess. Oh, okay. What well, what was your first one? It was called Cat's Eye. It was a okay. Stephen, mm -hmm. Stephen King um, selection of short stories mm -hmm. about through a cat's eye. There were I think we had four vignettes, and the sort of the the one that I did the most work on. We built a um, we built a set that was six times life size. So the, all the furniture was huge. The baseboard was like, uh, we, we built this bedroom. The baseboard was like six feet tall. And um, we built a bed and chairs and tables. And um, there was a little creature in it. And, um, and so it was all built so that the creature could actually operate as a, um, a human in a, in a uh, costume. But um Anyway, it was it was a good show. It was a lot of fun, and um, we did probably maybe my fifth or sixth show. We did um, we did uh, trick or treat, and that was um, that was my first horror film. Um, I mean, Stephen King was it was yeah. horror in a way, and it was a lot of um, suspense and. Um, and mystery, sure. but as far as like pure, more uh, visceral horror, I guess Trick or Treat was was the uh, first one. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. We built the house that yeah. the uh, main character lived in. We built the radio station where Gene Simmons was the DJ. Yeah, and we had the our director Charles Martin Smith had uh, made a name for himself in the film Starman. Which I don't know if you'd seen seen that or not. But, oh yeah, um, yeah, John yeah. Carpenter movie. I love it. Yeah, yeah, and um, so that was good. We had um, oh, what's his name? Um, Mark Price from uh, yep. Family Ties was in it, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it was a it was a great sort of a collection of of folks at a at a good time in their career. Yeah. Yeah, it's an awesome movie, um, underrated movie, and I think maybe now it's starting to to get recognized by you know people that love Halloween theme horror, especially like me, and um, and metal, you know, old school eighties yeah. metal. It's oh. got a great soundtrack. Um, I love that. Ozzy Osbourne and Gene Simmons, like you said, appear in it too. So it's it's got a little yeah. bit of everything in it. Um, yeah. Um, what what are some of your other memories? If we can stay on that for just a minute, because again, it's it's. I just love that movie and and um, any any other anecdotes that uh, you can tell us about from that set because uh, yeah, like you said, Mark Price is in it and of course uh, the character of Sammy Kerr. He's he's the rock star brought back from the dead and everything. Um, yeah, and, and they they had this guy Kevin Yeager come in and he did the um, I don't know if you're, the the speakers that 
the face came out of the speakers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and mm-hmm. that was really cool. And we were there for all the tests for that. Awesome. And, uh, and just, you know, a lot of cool effects. And we had a, um, we filmed in a neighborhood where we blew the windows out. I think we built some windows out of balsa wood and candy glass. Um, that was a night shot. And I can't remember what all happened, but um, there was a one of these hiccups where the windows didn't come out on cue and we had to like scramble and stuff like that. And then they finally came out. Um, and then we built the uh, exterior of the radio station out in a field where there was a actual uh, radio antenna. Okay. So we went and scouted it and unbeknownst to me, because I wouldn't have known, but where there's an antenna where what you see going up, there are these, um, and this is the way uh, it was back in the day. They came down and you had all these sort of tentacles coming out of the bottom in a radial fashion. That I guess they were grounding for the antenna. And so we had to really sort of uh, work around all that stuff because you couldn't just dig or, or, or uh, pierce the ground anywhere mm-hmm. to do that uh, exterior. But, um, you know, it was, it was almost 40 years ago. So some things are hazy at this point. But it was exciting. I know that, um, you know, it was my first job as a foreman and and I really got along good with the uh, with the director and the producers. They were really nice people. So it was a good, a good time. As they say, a good time was had by all. Yeah. So, and like you said, this this was your first job as construction foreman. Can yeah. Just for our viewers, can you describe a little bit about what, what actually that entails for people well, that don't know? We get, um, we have a design team, mm-hmm. you know, they read the script, they meet with the director. So they design the sets to fit the story um, for, as far as description goes, as far as camera goes, as far as action goes. So they design the, the uh, they design the sets, then we take the drawings, we build the sets, we do, um, You know, there are certain elements to the sets you have to do. You have like walls that come out so that they can have room for the camera. They go back in, uh, that we call those wild walls. So you build wild walls, you build walls so that maybe the ceilings fly out for camera angles and um, things break away. But your, your, uh, your duty to build and maintain the scenery for the life of the show. Um, and, you know, you, you, you build, you take them down, you build, you take them down, you keep them in good repair. And um, you know, sometimes you have to change. Sometimes you have an overnight change. You have to come in and do that. And, um, and that's kind of, you know, and you have to um, adhere to a budget. You know, you set a budget in the beginning when, once you've digested all the information and know what you have to build, you, you, um, analyze it and assign costs to it. And um, that's, you know, that's part of the deal too. That's the tricky part is, is staying on schedule and on budget and uh, making sure that the creative people get what they need. And the producers are happy that you didn't go over budget. So as I say, I serve many masters, those above me and those below me, because without your crew, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure your crew is served and you got to make sure that the um, design and the um, creative team are served as well. Yeah, like you said, you are you're you're right in the middle there. You're you're serving the higher ups, but then yeah, you're like you know the the leader of the crew for the most part. Um, and yeah, it sounds like so responsible for so much of what we see on screen. Yeah, it was it was uh, <laughs> you know and people. People come to Wilmington for stage work because they're yeah. they're um, you know they're ten sound stages there, and all of that needs needs to be built up, right? Yeah, it needs to be built, and you know being on stage gives you a lot of control. You don't have to worry about the weather, 
the uh, the sound or or whatever, and mm -hmm. you can you know, it's climate controlled. Your um, and you can build a world that doesn't exist on the outside. That's probably the thing that I'm most enamored by in the in the industry is that you get to create a world that doesn't exist outside of what you're doing. Like when we did the sets for the Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm. that world doesn't exist anywhere, but you, you, you got to build it. And, mm -hmm. and that's just, um, who gets to do that? You know, who gets to build, you know, 600 feet of curving underground tunnels with, um, stuntmen on skateboards <laughs> flying through them and um you know we got to work with the um, jim henson company on several shows i got to meet jim henson at the beginning of the first oh, wow. turtles movie and uh he was awesome really nice guy just super mellow and chill and um built you know you build us a, a Grouch Town was a scaled down city to fit the size of a Muppet. You know, the, the buildings were tiny. Yeah. The um the bricks were tiny, the the signage was tiny and all this stuff. And um the the thing about a Muppet set is the set starts at four feet off the ground because below the set or all the puppeteers. Yeah, the puppeteers. They're, they're out of sight. Yeah. So they're down there. We built these things called Muppet carts. So mm -hmm. the operator has got his knees on this little card. It's on casters. He's got a video monitor and he's got a micro, he's got a, a headset on with a microphone because a lot of times the puppeteer is also the voice actor for the, for the puppet. So he's got, Usually a hand in the in the mouth, and the, his other mm -hmm. hand is running an arm or two, and he's looking at the monitor because he's seeing what the camera sees. So mm -hmm. he's reacting to that. And um, we had this scene in in Grouchtown where they had this huge sort of um, not a riot but a huge uprising, and you've got about twenty five of these people operators all on the ground. If you look at it from four feet up, it looks like Muppets having their thing. And you look at, then you back up and you see the whole thing and you mm -hmm. see 25 more people on the ground doing all this stuff. And this was before <laughs> wireless. So mm -hmm. each one of these monitors and all these headsets had cable running out of them. So there were miles of cable and, um, and it was just like, total chaos if you looked at the big mm -hmm. picture you look at the from four feet up it was like you know it was a muppet movie so that was like um and you, until you see it you can't imagine what it takes yeah. to make it yeah yeah i'm i'm sure and and like you said you're working on for the most part on these sound stages where there's nothing there you're creating it literally from from thin air in, in the, walking into the most part the building yeah and um you, the art department creates these environments uh whether they've been we built spaceships we built castles um grouch town the uh the the, the turtle den and the turtle tunnels and the uh underground uh subway stations where they lived the creative um, input is just, that's what's so stimulating. They yeah. create a world that doesn't exist otherwise, and you're the one that is able to execute it. And, um, yeah, it's um, it's stimulating, and it's challenging, and it keeps you awake at night sometimes. <laughs> so I'm sure. I'm sure with so, much, with so much... You know, hanging on it and everything, and 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 um, being in charge of so much and so many people, like you said, under you that that um, are depending on it as well. Um, I saw the, the Abyss is another one that you you worked on, James Cameron. Yeah, yeah, it was um, a um, 
probably the, the I'd say physically, emotionally, the biggest challenge because we um, like of all of them. Yeah, because we we came into I I, I had um, got my name in the hat to work on it, and mm -hmm. so I'd call the the construction coordinators from England, and so we set up an interview, and I and um, I drove down there, and uh, my in laws lived about twenty five miles away, so we drove over and spent the night, and I drove in on Saturday morning for an interview, and. You know, after a couple of hours or so, he said, well, you've, you've got the job. And I said, okay, great. When do you want me to start? And he says, Monday. And I said, okay. Um, he says, but we need a crew. You can't, you have to bring a crew. So I spent the rest of the day at the interview office making phone calls, trying to field a crew to show up and we actually started on Tuesday cause everybody traveled in on Monday mm -hmm. and um, they had made this crazy schedule that they wanted uh, James Cameron wanted to start filming on eight, eight, 88. And it was already the um, almost the end of May. And I don't know if did you, if you saw the film, but the, uh, the sets were enormous. Yeah and underwater and that and pardon my French, but that shit's not going to happen in two months. Yeah. They haven't even finished uh, building the tank yet, which w it was, had been an abandoned nuclear facility that Duke power had started building in 1977 and had abandoned by the um, mid eighties because of cost overruns and the sentiment against nuclear power was, was so, uh, so high that they just they just walked away from it and i would say that the um the rate payers ended up right you know they just wrote it off and the rate payers ended up paying for it but this this um filmmaker named earl owensby and i use the term loosely um in shelby north carolina he he had made a fortune in the tool business and um decided he wanted to be in film he wanted to write, direct, and star in his own movies. So he went to, um, uh, Shelby's about 45 miles west of Charlotte. So he went to Charlotte. He, he hired camera people. He hired some script writers and bought equipment. And he had a facility outside of town with a couple of warehouses. And um, he started with his own, uh, well, production company making um they're kind of uh b movies like you might see the old drive-in theater or something like that mm -hmm. um, but he was the star it was always like um a good guy who was wronged and then he spends the rest of the film um seeking vengeance on whoever wronged him that kind of a thing so anyway he made a ton of money doing these little films and um, that power plant had sat uh, idle for several years and it finally went up in a public auction for the property and everything on it. It was a cash only auction. Mm. And so he went to the auction and people were bidding, people were bidding and, um, it, and it's ridiculous. He paid $5 million for the whole place in cash that day. You know, he had the cash with him. He put it down and there were like warehouses. There were football fields full of structural steel that had been bought for the reactor plant. And when I say football fields, I mean, huge stuff. The I-beams that were, four feet tall that weighed 500 pounds of foot that were all, all this stuff was engineered for specifically for this, um, for this power plant. And they had built the uh, reactor vessel, which was a giant tank where you would, they, it was lined with stainless steel and the re reactor would actually be in there and it would have a, the domed roof over the top. Mm -hmm. And um, so it had been brought up to halfway. 
it didn't have the dome over the top. It had stopped at sort of um, midway. And um, so the first thing he did, is it had a, a stainless steel liner in it. So the first thing he did was he got somebody to come in and scrap out all the stainless steel. And that exposed the concrete uh, underneath. So they finished the concrete and made the, made the tank, it was 200 feet across and I guess it was a hundred feet deep. And we built the set at about 55 feet um, below below the uh, surface of the water. And we put a platform in there with the, the drop off that creates the abyss. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had through different vendors, we had the, the cylinders built for the different pods of the, uh, of the uh, drill rig. And then we built the interiors on two of the uh, warehouses there on the site. But it was, um, I mean, we worked from the day we started, which was May 15th. We had uh, Memorial Day off and we had 4th of July off. And the next day off we had was Labor Day. We worked 12 or 14 hours a day all the way through the summer just to get something ready to film. And then, and it went on, we were, you know, a couple of months probably past his, his shoot date, but mm -hmm. then we filmed there for probably three or four months. And then they went to Los Angeles to do um, the process work with the, there was another underwater tank there where they could bring water in and out as they needed it to do the sort of the, the in, in footage. Mm -hmm. of the show but yeah i was there for nine months and uh it was it was a it was a slog it was like a forced march every day but um and jim cameron is like a um i'm not sure he's human <laughs> he would come in i mean they would work 14 hours a day and then he would watch you know back in those days you had dailies where you know they they shot it on film and they'd mm -hmm. have to send the film off to a lab either in uh, New York or LA or you know, Miami, have the film developed and they'd send it back and then they they had a screening room they put on a reel and they would watch. Maybe the dailies were a day or two old, but they'd watch everything they'd shot for that day to see if mm -hmm. they need to reshoot something. So he'd work fourteen hours, then he'd watch a couple of hours of dailies, and then sleep maybe if he slept. I don't know if he slept or not. And then come back in and do it the next day and the next day and the next day. And, uh, but it was pretty incredible. I mean, they just re-released the film in 4K with um, uh, elevated uh, digital sound. And, um, and they were able to, um, it was, a, you know, a director's cut. So mm -hmm. a lot of stuff made it into the re-release that wasn't in the original. We went to okay. see it. Um, back in the fall it was pretty good so it and I, I would say that was in it was released in 1990 i think or 89 it, it still holds up pretty good i would say yeah and they you know they they broke a lot of um barriers and visual effects um for that film that played into his next film which was the terminator 2 oh definitely yeah. judgment day where the where the um the villain keeps changing shapes and he liquefies and puts back together. All that um, technology was developed in the, during the abyss for footage we did on that. So yeah, it was, um, and I, that was probably a, um, for me, a big turning point in my career because it, I was introduced to people who would be instrumental in helping me be a coordinator down the line so in fact my next film i was a coordinator and then i never looked back after that and, and it, it sounds like he didn't make his 8888 start date though no he didn't make it and um a lot of blood was shed on that film a lot of, <laughs> producers, a lot of producers got fired yeah um the guy that hired me um he got fired oh man um, in fact there were five different construction coordinators on that film wow. by the by the time it was over but uh, and the, the construction budget was probably 
I can remember it was 3.2 million on paper when we started, and it was probably well over 6 million by the time they finished, which in 1988 dollars was a lot of money for construction. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great movie. I, I do need to rewatch it and see that 4K version yeah, now. It's, it's really good. I remember seeing it when it came out in the theater, actually. I loved it. I loved it then, and, and but I, it's been a while. I need to watch it again and see that new 4K cut. Yeah. And filming underwater, you know, that is, that's a chore. Mm -hmm. You've got, you know, 30 or 40 people in scuba gear. You've got lights, you've got actors, you've got safety divers. You've got, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many moving parts, special effects. And, you know, working a 12 hour day is hard enough if you're upright on dry land, but doing it underwater. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. And you said from there, it opened up even more doors. And, and then you started going from construction foreman to working as construction coordinator on, on most of your projects from there, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what is, what is the difference there? Are you just more, more responsibility, I, I guess. Yeah. What, I mean, you're, you're, you're the head of the department. So yeah. you, you meet, you're always meeting with the heads of other departments, the lighting and the grip and the mm -hmm. design team, the producers, special effects, stunts or whatever. So you're more integrated into the, what you know, might call the big picture. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, part of the, you're part of the moving operation. Um, so you're, you're ultimately responsible for setting the budget and keeping the budget and the schedule and managing the manpower. Wow. And, um, you know, it, once again, you're serving many masters. You're just yeah. maybe moved up a notch. So, um, but it's, it's a good, enjoyable vantage point to be at because you're, you, you know, you get exposed to a ton of stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily be exposed to. Yeah. Now, and it, and it sounds like you're a movie fan yourself. Is that right? Are you, do you, and, enjoy movies and enjoy watching the finished product of, of some of these movies that you've worked on over the years? I do. I, I do enjoy films. I, I don't see as many as I should. Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe because I've worked on so many. I don't know. Yeah. I've read so many scripts. And um, sometimes I enjoy the process more than the finished product. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, no offense to anyone. But, um, but I, I won't say sometimes they're disappointing. I was going, wow, we did all that work. And you <laughs> see 10 seconds of, yeah. you know, whatever that, you know, that uh, $200,000 scene we did, you know, mm -hmm. or, or they cut it, you know, sometimes it's on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm a pretty avid uh, movie fan and I'll enjoy talking to other uh, trades that that work in the industry, like yeah. when um, the film, uh, the little film on now, the uh, director of photography has done a ton of stuff, and he's worked here before. And I really enjoy talking to him about what he's worked on, and he knows a lot of people I've worked on, or I've worked with. Um, globally, it's a very small business. Mm -hmm. If you got on a film and you had if you made a list of 20 people and pass it around a room, somebody, in fact, more than one is going to have worked with somebody that, you know, yeah, somewhere. Um, and if, and, and now that the, you've got the IMDB and everything, mm -hmm. if you l look for somebody you'll see, and then they'll mention all the people that you've worked with that they've worked with. Like that, although you've never worked with them before, but they've worked with a ton of people that you've worked with. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, it's the whole six degrees of separation. If you mm -hmm. mention something, um, oh yeah, I worked with that guy or I worked with that guy or, you know, or that, or that I worked with that lady. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's funny that way. Yeah. And, and yeah, you went on to, to work on many sets as construction coordinator and, um, it's funny you mentioned six degrees of separation. I was just talking to somebody else about that and how 
there's a six degrees of separation from Michael Myers. I think that you could name almost anybody in the business. And at this point, between the 13 films of this franchise, you can link them in six degrees, or in many cases, a lot less, I think, to Michael Myers in some way. And now, of course, you're you're linked really close um, after working on um, two films. Um, before Halloween Kills, though, there was Halloween 2018. And yeah. I know we're, we're jumping ahead a few decades here, but, but um, what was your, I guess, relationship to Michael Myers before working on that film? Did you know the original film or any of the other films in the franchise? I saw the original. Okay. In, in uh, 78, mm -hmm. when it came out. Um, and um, I don't, and I'm, I think I saw the original and I saw Halloween 2. Mm -hmm. And then that's all I saw of the franchise. I didn't see Season of the Witch mm -hmm. or four or five or six or all the different iterations i actually watched all of them before i went to halloween 45 i either rented or bought them all just to because i just never seen them you know yeah and just to see where 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 the story arc went and you know people would die and then people would come back and um so 2018 was really kind of a a uh, reimagining of the yes. of the the lore of the story, so it was uh, it was a fun it was a fun thing. But I, yeah, I was familiar with Michael Myers, and um, obviously Jamie Lee Curtis. I'd worked on another show with her back in the nineties, and um, super sweet lady, um, really amazing. And um, you know, I think the whole. Reboot would never have happened had she not agreed to uh, to be part of the cast. But that just made it, I think, too big for anybody to walk away from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was really good. And that one, of course, was um, shot in Charleston, South Carolina. And right. uh, um, had you worked with David Gordon Green or any, any of that crew before then? Well, I had worked. I had done season one and three of Eastbound and Down. Okay, yeah. which um, is before they filmed or before they formed Rough House Pictures, but uh, obviously Danny McBride was the star, mm -hmm. and um, David and Jody Hill took turns directing. So David, Jody, and um, Danny McBride formed Rough House Pictures. Uh, subsequent to that, and Danny and um, I can't remember the other fellow's name wrote the script for 2018 and for um, Halloween Kills mm -hmm. and for Halloween Ends, as far as that goes. Um, so I was not really scheduled to do Halloween 2018. Another coordinator had started it, and um, they had set up offices, and for whatever reason, it didn't take off right away. Mm-hmm. So he got a he got a, a call to do another show, and he says I can't wait around. So he took the other show, and then um, Richard Wright, the designer, called me and said, "Hey, are you available to do this?" And I said, "Yeah, we're coming off of a uh, we did a TV series called Good Behavior, and it just wrapped." So I said, "Yeah, we'll come down and do it." And so um, that was that was sort of the, the you know a lucky break. For a couple of reasons, but you know, we got another job, and then it introduced me to the uh, environment where I would end up um, being <laughs> anointed to play Doctor Loomis. So yeah, it's a good well, thing. Well, yeah, you, you you come in to there and and you worked on it, and and um, so on the 2018 film, you know, you're there as coordinator. So again, I mean, so many of those sets you had a hand in building and, and, um, and knowing just those first two films, like you did at that time, was it exciting for you to, to be working on a Michael Myers movie or was it kind of just, just another, no. another gig at that point? No, it was good because the fact that they were bringing it back. Yeah. I think was, it was electric. You know, yeah. everybody was jacked about it. Uh, David, yeah. 
Danny, um, the uh, and the, you know they hooked up with Blumhouse this time. Yeah, and you know, and the, I think the Blumhouse crowd was really um, they were all in, and it was a it, it was a departure from them because it was a bigger budget film than they were used to doing. They mm -hmm. were usually in, in the five million dollar sort of range and um yeah but jason blum made money on everything he's ever done this stuff has been super successful and he's so prolific so um the the line producer and the production supervisor were part of they worked for pretty much uh, on a ton of blumhouse stuff so they were there and he's got he's got sort of a brand ambassador a guy named ryan turek i don't know if you've ever met him but um he was there, so he's there to to sort of keep everything uh, on a um, trajectory that that really supports the art and the uh, recognition of the characters and stuff like that, yeah. um, as it relates to um, to to the um, organization. So, um, and, and the fact that Jamie Lee was in it, it just, you know, everything was uh, kind of a perfect storm for that reason. And when, um, you know, the, the original script that we read started off with a flashback from the uh, 1978 film. It picked up with a scene where Loomis shoots Michael Myers six times. He falls off the balcony. Um, you know, they, they run over there and the body's gone. Um, as it turns out, um, this wasn't that film because of, for budgetary reasons. That that scene alone would have dictated probably an extra, you know, four or $500,000 between soundstage and the set and the stunts and the lighting and all of that kind of stuff. And um, so they... You know, stroke of a pen. They got rid of that, and they they created a, a different uh, beginning where they they you know pick up Michael um, forty years later, mm -hmm. and um, but the the filming of it was um, always really good because uh, uh, David was so into it. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I got to meet, um, uh, I'd already met Jamie Lee, but um, Jim Courtney, who plays Michael Myers, he's the, uh, in fact, he'd auditioned for it before that film. Nick Castle was there. And, um, you know, to meet all the sort of legacy people that have been involved with it was really, yeah. uh, really great. I had a good time there. And yeah, you know, Charleston's a pretty cool place to hang out too. Definitely. And uh, what what was the the Jamie Lee Curtis project you worked on? Just curious. The previous well, one. It was a sci-fi. Um, I guess it was. A, it was more science fiction than horror. It was called. Oh, okay. Virus was the name of it. it Virus. A, okay. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> uh, no offense to anybody, but it was script wise. Um, it didn't really have any redeeming uh, qualities and, um, you know, had a lot of cool stuff. We got to build a lot of cool stuff, but she was the, you know, she was the, the female lead in it. Uh, Donald Sutherland was the male lead. Uh, William, William Baldwin was in it. And um, it was just a big old gobbledygook of a, too many, too many bad ideas coming together with too much money you know yeah um and as uh, ironically it was um john bruno who had been the uh, visual effects coordinator on the abyss and terminator 2 and um other other uh, james cameron projects uh this was his first directorial debut and it was kind of a gift to him for having worked in the trenches all these years. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, uh, Gail Ann Hurd, who was 
uh, James Cameron's ex-wife, and she produced The Abyss and Terminator 2, and um, she was producing Virus also. So this show was um, his uh, his sort of uh, coming out party, so to speak. Yeah, and it was probably um, ill advised because he'd never directed before, mm -hmm. and it was not a great script to start with, and um, and everything was. Um, it wasn't about acting you know it was about stuff it was about a monster it was about a robot it was about an explosion but it, the story never like came out you know mm -hmm. the, the story this it, it the film didn't carry the story it just you know it was just a bunch of stuff and at the yeah. end of the movie he said what did i just see you know because it didn't um you know the script is the most important thing mm -hmm. you know it, you've got to have a good story to get to you got to start with a good story to have a good story mm -hmm. to get people interested to be passionate about it and to perform accordingly so but anyway uh, we got to meet her and she was she was super friendly and um really nice and uh, um, then on um halloween 2018 you know, she would have the shooting crew wear name tags so that she would always call you by your name. She wouldn't say, hey, you, or hey, yeah. so and so. She would say, hey, Matt, how are you doing today? Or hey, John, how are you doing today? Or hey, Reva, could you, you know, could we get a cup of coffee? You know, mm -hmm. but very down to earth and uh, just very personable. Yeah. Great, That's a great heart. That's really cool to hear. And yeah, we've always heard that about her and, and heard great things from people yeah. that were have been on sets with her and everything. So so you reunite, reunited with Jamie Lee and, and you're here on this set uh, helping them recreate Haddonfield basically for this, like you said, this reboot, this reimagining, this requel yeah. is what I like to call it. Um, what was the, the most challenging part of that shoot that you I guess the most challenging thing you had to build for that shoot well we um, the the most challenging thing I guess we, we built the uh, basement set in mm -hmm. Jamie Lee's house where mm -hmm. she had her um, her cellar with all her armaments down there and everything and um, it wasn't so much a challenge when we built it, but we came back and did um, reshoots. And um, after the film was, after they cut it together, we we wrapped in about March, I guess. And then I got a call at the end of May and said, "Hey, we want to we want to reshoot um, mm -hmm. the end of the the end of the show." I said okay. So we loaded up, went back down to Charleston, and we out in the parking lot outside of the uh where we had our shop and our stages in charleston we built um an upstairs and we built the upstairs and the downstairs of that same house we built the whole uh cellar down below and the upstairs and um we it was a, a massive build didn't have a lot of time to do it but we did the whole the fire and wow. the where he gets trapped down there yeah and that was probably the, the the biggest challenge because we were we were able to do probably what we should have done the first time yeah. it was just a lot more expansive a lot more visceral a lot you know, a ton of um mechanical effects and special effects and um it's it's you know where michael gets trapped in the fire and uh, down in the down in the uh, cellar mm -hmm. and everything, so that was cool, and that was the for, for me, I guess um, mm -hmm. that was the best part of the uh, 2018 was actually the reshoots because we really got to uh, sort of get out of the box and do some do some uh, good stuff, yeah. So some wild stuff. So so your most challenging, but your best time on set too was was during the reshoots 
And and yeah, I mean that's right there in the parking lot, recreating that whole climactic scene and and everything down there in in her uh, basement there at the end. I mean that that's oh. yeah. And we built her bedroom also uh -huh. on, okay. on the inside of the stage, and that's where. Michael's is in the closet. They've got the louver doors. It's almost a uh, you know uh, a um, tribute like a, to the original, right? Louver doors, and he's uh, stabbing into the closet and everything. It was uh, kind of ironic, and um, but everybody was like when when they came back for the reshoots, everybody was super jacked because they'd seen the they'd seen the film cut. And they knew they had something, so they this just kind of put it over the top with the reshoots. Yeah, I do remember the excitement when the anticipation, you know, was thick that year, and everybody was just, you know, so excited for the return of this franchise and these characters, and and you know, like when the trailers dropped and everything, and everybody's losing their mind. And and I've talked to James Jude Courtney and a lot of people, Christopher Nelson, a lot of people that worked on that film um, over the years. And they've all kind of said that, that, yeah, there was this electricity on set that just everybody was on every level of the crew was there in part because they, they just really wanted to be there for, for this project, you know, as much as it was a job, it was like, everybody was, was like kind of extra excited because of what it was is what I keep hearing. That's such a legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that it was a, a reboot, I won't say starting over, but you just sort of drop the content of all those yeah. interstitial films and went, you know, it, from the time he was locked up and now he's, you know, still locked up when the film starts until he escapes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good. It was, um, a lot of, uh, I think, anticipation every day. You know, everybody's licking their chops to to get the day going. Yeah, so it's really good. Yeah, and good then like, really good energy. Yeah, and like you said, that that kind of um, introduced you to to D the David Gordon Green and, and the whole Rough House uh, crew. There, it sounds like, and and you go on to work with them again and of course in halloween kills and you come on as construction coordinator um and before we know it you're on screen taking on the role as dr loomis this iconic yeah. role in in these flashback scenes so i i know you've talked about it before but walk us through how how after all these decades of working on on all these sets for all these filmmakers the decision was made to to put you in front of the camera as uh, the new Dr. Lewis. Well, that actually happened on 2018 when, when the, cause we were still working with the original script. So, okay, so they were going to do it. Our very first um, department head meeting, we're sitting in a conference room and all the important people are at a table and the rest of us were in, on the perimeter, just in folding chairs and they're going through scenarios and schedule and so forth and so on. And um, the first AD leans forward and he looks down and he says, hey. I said, me? And he says, yeah. He says, take your glasses off. So I took my glasses off. He says, give me a look. So I gave him the sort of the stare and he punched David. He says, hey, we've got our Loomis right here. So David said, yeah, works for me. So um, that, that was, that's where the plan was hatched. Subsequently, they wrote that scene out of the script. But once the success of uh, 2018 was, was um, had come to fruition, they knew they had the horsepower to do their flashback sequence that they had wanted to do mm -hmm. even though this wasn't the same scene it gave birth to a whole what 15 minutes of 1978 Haddonfield mm -hmm. and so when they came back to like they did Howling Kills at Wilmington and as soon as they showed up to start prep they just called me Loomis 
Hey, Loomis, what's going on today? Hey, Loomis, this, the Loomis, that. Hey, Loomis, you look like you need to put some weight on. You're looking a little too skinny and stuff like this. So anyway, that was, um, you know, it was all kind of fun and games. And then um, they said, well, uh, we need you to um, fly to Los Angeles and get a, a life cast done of your head for, um, for you know, prosthesis. So they flew me out to um, L.A. I went to a studio that Chris Nelson was um, involved with and uh, Vincent Van Dyke. And they shaved my head and my goatee and everything. They took, took a life cast and then they built, you know, they had a model to work with. So they had a, like a 3D of, of uh, Donald Pleasant's, you know, 3D model of his head. And then they mm -hmm. took mine and just built, you know, they put bags under my eyes, over my eyes, added to my ears, um, put a little made my head a little bit taller, um, put a little uh, prosthesis on the end of my nose. So I mean, there were 11 kind of small pieces all together. So they they uh, made those up there and then they shipped them back to Wilmington and we did a camera test one day and like, you know, full costume. And I just like pantomimed the scene and they said, that's it, we're done. So. I get, went back to my day job and kept doing that until um, until the fateful night that uh, I went on stage, which was we were we had a very ambitious build on that show. We built our Haddonfield um, neighborhood on stage. Oh yeah, six, six houses, trees. We had In, about including years. the Myers house too. Including well, we we took the Myers house from from the 78 film and mm -hmm. the house on either side of that, we had uh, enough um, archival information to recreate those two houses. So that was one side of the street. And then the other side of the street was a neighborhood where we did our 78 and, um, and 2019 trick or treating. It, mm -hmm. it played in two different eras so that when you were, trick-or-treating in the neighborhood, you always assumed that the house behind you was the Myers house and the house across the street was the one that the camera was seeing. So it was a cut to situation. Mm -hmm. So we copied three houses in this neighborhood called Carolina Heights. So those were on the other side of the street. And we did, you know, we paved the street, we carved all the trees on the uh, hero side to match the trees in 1978 that were in the uh, Pasadena neighborhood. And um, then we built the, we had the Haddon, Haddonfield Hospital going on. We built the burn set of um, Jamie Lee's, of uh, Jamie Lee's house mm -hmm. on the field at the studio. We built the exterior out in the country at another house to copy the house in Charleston. Um, so we were, we were um, going seven days a week on that show. And um, I was actually running a crew. We were, we were doing a, um, we're syncing up a scene from 2018 where uh, Will Patton gets stabbed in the neck. You remember, uh, do you remember that set? He gets stabbed in the neck by that doctor. Yep, yep. Let's start spurting. Yep. And um, so we picked that scene up at a location in Wilmington that we had to do a bunch of modifications to, to, to match it up. And I was actually running that crew out there. And, um, this was on Friday afternoon. So I knocked off, I left about three o'clock and I came home. I took a shower. I laid down for a couple of hours. Then I had to be at hair and makeup at six. So, uh, I was in hair and makeup for four hours mm -hmm. and then, uh, and then I walked over, we were right in front of the sound stage. So I went in the sound stage and I was in, as soon as I walked in, I was in the next scene up. So during the night I was in a half a dozen different scenes. Some I was like the uh, folk point and others where I was background. And um, we finished up about 7.30 in the morning 
I went back to hair and makeup and had everything taken off. I went home, had took a couple of shots of tequila and, and, uh, took about a two hour nap. And then I got up and went back to work. All in so, a day's work. Uh, all in a day and a night and a in day's a night. work. But th that was a short day. I don't think I'm, I don't think I went the distance that day. I kind of went in and checked on things and said, uh, yeah, we're good. Yeah. We'll see you guys Monday morning. So anyway, you, you, uh, but it was a lot of fun. You know, I had a ton of support from David and Attila, the first AD. He's actually the one who dis who discovered me. So I always give him props for that. And, um, the, the DP, Michael Simmons was a super guy and, mm -hmm. um, the producers, everybody was, uh, very supportive. And, um, uh, you know, the fact, I think the fact that I had, I was already tired when I showed up for work may have helped me because I wasn't nervous. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of, you know, kind of mellowed out by then. We, you know, had been up since, you know, four o'clock in the morning. It was already, you know, 10 or 11 that same night. And then we worked till all night. So, um, in a way, I think it just helped me um, to take the edge off a little bit. I could you know, maybe you know, just kind of ease into the character a little bit more and be that sort of um, rattled, uh, confused, sometimes um, Loomis, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense that, that, yeah, you would be tired after all of that. and But yeah, that would kind of help you to not have so much anxiety, I guess, you know, because, because yeah, if you stop to think about it, I mean, you're stepping into this role. I mean, if you think only two other guys have, have ever played it, Malcolm McDowell and of course, Donald Pleasance. And I mean, those, those are no small names to, to no. be in company with. I mean, that's no, a more they're... exclusive, that's a more exclusive club than even the Michael Myers actors club there. They're, they're heavy hitters. Yeah. I can remember, um, Although I, I guess my first exposure to Donald Pleasance was um, in a, the James Bond films, um, mm -hmm. but I can remember seeing Malcolm McDowell in um, Clockwork Orange, mm -hmm. and that film blew my mind. I mean, that was so unlike anything I'd seen before. Uh, the soundtrack, the acting the story the violence um was just uh, it was um a game changer it just as, as far as filmmaking goes just to yeah. see something that was like so totally unbridled yeah so yeah it was uh, and i'm sure it, it it opened a lot of doors for him too because he got a ton of exposure from that film yeah i, I met him at, at the, he was at the cincinnati um the connor cool. went to cincinnati yeah. yeah super nice guy very cool the the two surviving loomises together in one uh, room that's that's historic for us and, and i've met every michael myers that's nice. ever played the part so that's been great too yeah we've got uh one photograph it's got everybody but dick warlock in it oh wow so, yeah, that was really good. That's awesome. And so so you shot all of your stuff that one night. Um and did did you shoot other stuff that didn't make the the final cut of the film? Yeah. Every every scene I was in, we filmed that night on stage because mm -hmm. that was the um the stuff in the neighborhood, the trick or treat footage did not have any police or uh Loomis presence in it. So everything was was on stage that one night, and then we um, we we filmed the 2019 footage of that neighborhood first, and then we then we brought everything down to the uh, 78 look. And while we were doing that, they were doing all the the shooting crew had come off of three weeks of nights. They had been shooting the 78 and 2019 trick or treat footage in the neighborhood. So they were at the end of their run of nights and, and I happened to be lucky enough to get on their last night of nights when I came in. So they, they were already in on their light schedule. 
and then they turned around um, over the weekend. I guess they had a late call on Monday, but they went back into days um, for the rest of the show. So yeah, it was um, it was fun, and then you know, I think it created a bond between me and uh, James Courtney. Yeah. And certainly Aaron uh, Aaron Armstrong, who played yeah. uh, who played the uh, 1978 Michael Myers, and David and um, Attila and Michael Simmons. You know, we all had fun. You know, you got to have fun. Yeah. If you can't have fun in this business, you shouldn't be in it because you got to have fun. Well, I love hearing that it was fun, and and. You said four hours in in makeup and prosthetics, and when you were when you were out there, was it? I mean, because again, you you've been on so many sets, and then here you are, I guess, for the first time, and on the other side of the camera. I mean, was it surreal for you? Was it hitting home, or was it just you were so tired? It, it just well, wasn't no, even. It, it was surreal, you know. And when 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 I'm not on camera, uh, they said, "Well, we're," and it was pretty warm on stage, and. Um, they said, well, and I had on, um, the, I think the pants were wool, and I had a T-shirt and a long sleeve shirt and a tie and a, and the, uh, the overcoat. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, well, there was a little hallway out the back with uh, a couple of chairs, so they would always have me go back and sit there where it was cooler and then come check on me. You know, it's so weird. You know, are you doing all right? Can I get you anything? So no, I'm fine. I'm, you know, it's all good. So, and a couple of my guys were um, construction guys were working standby that night on stage. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of fun to hang with them. So yeah, it was fun. And you know, David um, he advised me to join the Screen Actors Guild, which I did. And um, so I, I will um, when things wind down on the construction end. You know, it's not outside the realm of possibility that I would trying to audition for other things that need um, people of a certain age without hair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what a screen debut to, to be able to say that that's your, your debut uh, role. Yeah. Yeah. The doctor is in as, as I say. I love it. I love it. And that, that is fascinating for me. I don't think I had ever heard that before that, that, you know, technically you were cast as Loomis back in 2018 and and we would have seen we would have seen you play the role had that original script um gotten filmed so that's yeah. fascinating to me that that was kind of a they had you in in their pocket already um yeah. making that first movie kind of in their back a, pocket yeah it was a footnote in history and i mean at the time that 2018 was released i think you know they were going to test the water if it yeah. had not done well, there probably wouldn't have been a Halloween Kills. Right. Or Halloween Ends. But they had, you know, they had conceived the fact that they were going to do a trilogy. And Jamie Lee had bought in to do three films. And um, when 2018 did so well, uh, I think our budget was like $14 million on that. And it was probably twice that on Halloween Kills. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a much bigger film. It had a much bigger vision uh, obviously, we built you know over a million dollars on the once on the one set, with not counting all the other sets we did, and a ton of extras and a lot of a uh, lot more special effects and stuff like that. So, it painted a much bigger picture. Uh, you know, sadly, the um, COVID came along, and it was punted for a year, and mm -hmm. then the fact that it opened theatrically one day and then the next day it was streaming i think probably didn't do you know didn't do a favor to the box office mm -hmm. maybe done better if it stayed in theaters for a while but um i think it's it still did okay but 2018 um that turned a lot of heads oh yeah it, it definitely brought the whole thing back in, in such a huge way yeah and i think it, uh, commercially, I think it did like 200 million domestic. Yeah, kind of right out of the gate, and um, it, it um, feathered a lot of people's nests, you might say. Absolutely, and and yeah, you're talking about how much 
bigger a scope it was. I mean, for you specifically on the other side of the camera, aside from that that night as Loomis, I mean, yeah, you had to recreate 1978 Haddonfield. Not just Haddonfield, but 78 version of Haddonfield, too. I mean, yeah. it's it's such an undertaking, and it, but it's so effective when we watch that film, and I just know so many fans love specifically that part of the film the most is is that that whole flashback sequence a lot of fans just really love it and how how many details they were able to match up um yeah no it was really good from the art department standpoint they did such a great job yeah recreating you know we had the picture cards we had the costumes the firearms the whole um and then you know they they uh, manipulated the film stock to uh, make it look almost, uh, I won't say more video-like, but uh, they downgraded the quality of it to make it uh, a mesh more with the 78 footage. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I thought, you know, my personal uh, favorite part was just the flashback footage, you know, the facts, and, and it's so ironic about Halloween, the original Three, what, three people got murdered in the 1978 version? I think it was 43 people got murdered and in kills. kills. I mean, they were, they were true to the title, that's for sure. They definitely were. <laughs> um, I'm curious, when, when you were out there um, filming, having seen the, the two movies that you had seen at that point, those original two with Donald in the role, were you, like, trying to channel any of Donald or, or any of that at the time? I watched a lot of, um, I, I um, spoke with a, a voice coach. I, mm -hmm. I have a daughter who used to do a lot of theater and she's done some, um, uh, some film and television work, but she had a voice coach here that she worked with a lot. Uh, and so I worked with her a couple of sessions, just trying to get the uh, facial sort of, uh, he's got this thing with his nose sometimes, so he kind of, his nostrils flare out and get the timbre and pace of the voice. So uh, she had um, had had done a bunch of sound bites and, and recorded several scenes. Just, you know, just try to work on these, you know, it's the, mm -hmm. the cadence and the, um, um, I couldn't ever quite get his voice, but I could I could get the sort of mannerisms and the um, the the pace down. So yeah, and I you know certainly I tried to tried to channel the actor as much as I could. Yeah, but you do what you can when you can, as you can. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it definitely captures the the essence of Loomis. And it was just such a, you know, pleasant surprise for so many of us fans that, you know, didn't didn't really see it coming. And, and uh, you know, it was because Jamie Lee Curtis, Lori is, for lack of a better term, kind of the new Loomis in this new trilogy. I mean, she kind of takes over that role. But to, yeah. to get that whole flashback and to, and to have scenes of Loomis that take place that night, but that we didn't see in the original film. I think it was just a real treat for everybody. Were you um, were you surprised or, or what was your reaction when, when the film came out? And a lot of fans, and, and myself included, like the very first time I saw it, were thinking, well, this has got to be CGI because it looks just like Donald Pleasant's resurrected and and as we know now it, it wasn't cgi it was you with with some of christopher nelson's um makeup what was your reaction when that was like the the first few days of the film coming out and everybody's like oh that cgi loomis is amazing well we went to we went to the theater on opening night and um I, i'll have to say just watching the footage when that scene comes up when he bursts into the house I won't say there was a hush over the crowd, but there was like, you know, WTF, what's, you know, what's going on here? Yeah. And, and then after the film was over, walking, you know, and it was pretty well attended, 
just walking around, you could hear people talking about the uh, where they get that guy. Or I thought that was I thought that was going to be CGI. Yeah. And um, I went on the IMDb before the film. Before I was um, actually, I was not listed on the crew until right before the film was released. They didn't have. They didn't have the character's name. They didn't have an actor's name on the IMDb listing because I, mm -hmm. I just, just out of curiosity, I said, well, I'm wondering if I'm going to get a credit, you know, and I wasn't on there and I wasn't on there and I wasn't on there. And then right as the film was released, I was on there. So they were, uh, another thing there, I think they were kind of keeping it under wraps too. Yeah. Just to have that little sort of an aha moment. Yeah. You know, it definitely was was that moment in, in theater, seeing it for the first time, and and again, just it, it looking so well, and um and yeah, you you mentioned working um on the voice. So is that your voice we hear as well on the character? It is not my voice. It's okay, a, it's a voice actor that they've used before for Donald Pleasant's um voiceovers. Okay, and, um, they said do as best you can, and I had gotten it pretty close but the fact that i had to sort of yell all of my lines it was hard to yell and keep that yeah. same uh that same voice character going so and i mean i listened to the when they were doing the uh editing it was right down the hall from the art department so i could hear them playing that scene over and over again and um you know it sounded okay mm -hmm. but Obviously, that needed to be tuned up a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wasn't offended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's a great, you know, it's just a great marriage of all the everything coming together to to just bring this character back, you know, and yeah. um and yeah, it's not CGI, and that's the other thing that like is so refreshing is that it was done practically, and and that yeah, most of it is just just you and how you look and embodying. Um, the character and his look um, with, with a little bit of help on, in the makeup yeah. department. Yeah, kudos to Chris Nelson. Yeah. Yeah, he's the one that opened the door to the horror conventions because he does a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he contacted his agent and he says, hey, we've got this guy who played Loomis in Halloween Kills. You might want to talk to him about doing some con. So he called me, uh, a guy named uh, Sean Clark. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Sean or not, but yep, he's do. very prolific. And um, so, yeah, he's hooked me up with six conventions and um, super nice guy. And every everybody in his organization is, uh, has been really great to work with. Yeah. So I always thank Chris and... Um, it's uh, always nice to uh, hear from him. Yeah, good guy. And a good yeah. actor in his own right. Yes, yeah. Oh, he is, definitely. And, um, yeah, we love Christopher and Sean. Yeah, they're both awesome, and I know them. Um, so so the film comes out, and, of course, everybody's blown away that, that we've got a new Dr. Loomis, and 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 now the secret's out, and, and it's out there, and it's you, and... and um, you know, Christopher shared some behind the scenes photos to say, look, this is this is the real guy. It's not CGI and um, confirming, you know, put laying to rest or whatever uh, anybody was thinking. But um, and like you said, now you're you're making some convention appearances because you're you're part of this massive franchise. Now it's 13 films deep, um, 45 years as of last year. Um, now, did did you work on Halloween Ends, or, or was there any um, thought of well, working on that one? Or there was thought. Uh, I quit traveling. Ah, in, okay. Um, the, the Halloween twenty eighteen was the last film I did out of town, um, just because I don't want to leave my wife at home alone anymore. Yeah. And um, originally, they were going to do Halloween Ends in Wellington. And I, I don't know why that didn't work out. Uh, it may have been the Georgia tax credit or mm -hmm. any number of things. But um, Richard called me about doing it in, uh, in Savannah. And I said, well, my heart's there, but I just can't. I, I'm 
I'm not traveling anymore. I just, yeah. you know, it's, it's a conscious decision on my part to not be out of town months at a time because I've done that many times over my career. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my wife has been a rock and has kept the home fires burning and taking care of everything here. And, um, you know, after 40 years, I need to um, do my part, yeah, so to speak. Um, but strangely enough, my crew ended up going down to do the reshoots mm. of Halloween Ends. Um, after the film was, um, I guess, I, same thing after they cut it, mm-hmm. they did not like the ending. Mm-hmm. So they went down and did the um, whole thing at the um, junkyard where they have the grinder right. that comes up um, Michael's body. Mm-hmm. And they did some other pickup shots too. So um, about probably a dozen between construction and greens and paint went down there from uh, Wilmington and did the uh, the reshoots for the ending. So I I, indirectly, I had a hand in it. Yes, exactly. You, yeah, indirectly, you were you were still kind of there, kind of there in spirit. Anyway. Some of some of your uh, experience we actually worked on it. We built a bunch of scenery here. Oh, to, okay. To uh, ship down there, and so I actually worked on it for a week up here, building scenery that ended up getting shipped down there. So, so there you go. Yeah, I got a paycheck. There you go. <laughs> I got a, a one week paycheck from Halloween Kills. And and you're part of this modern trilogy of Halloween films now. I'm part of the family. That's right. You're part of the family. And like I said, you're part of this legacy now. And the Loomis legacy, that's even, like I said, the Michael Myers actors, that's an exclusive club. But Loomis, that's an even tighter, more exclusive. And yeah. you, you said you've been doing some conventions. And, of course, you did H45. That's where we uh, met in person for, for right. briefly while we were out there. And this was your first time there. Um, so we went to H40 in 2018. That was our first one of the Halloween conventions mm-hmm. and yeah. it just blew us away. And so what was your experience like from your point of view of being there? You know, you've been to some other conventions, but this one, it's all just Halloween, all just Halloween. Liars. All Halloween, all the time. Yeah. So it was great because I was able to go around and meet all these people from the whole world, you know, from the whole Halloween world. That's what I enjoyed the most. Yeah. It's just um, being able to meet all of these le- legacy characters from way back. And uh, I had known uh, Dick Warlock. He was the stunt coordinator on the abyss. So he and I had already been acquainted. So it was good to reconnect with him. That's awesome. And obviously to see uh, Nick Castle again yeah. and, um, and then at the end, when John Carpenter showed up, I mean, that's gold. Yeah. It was unbelievable. You said earlier, it was like, like the, the sea parted and, and yeah. I mean, it, was like Moses, it was like Moses walked in and everybody was like transfixed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. It, um, it was so cool. Like you said, he's the he's the father of all of this. And, and you know, it's just, you know, and to have Malik Akkad there too, you know, who's kept it. Yeah going yeah. i mean his dad kept it going when when it could have gone away after halloween three you know this could have all just stopped there but it was mustafa Akkad that brought it back and then you know malik that of course has kept it going um ever yeah. since yeah and you know there's i don't know where it is but there's talk of a, t- a tv series yep you know and as far as f- um features go they say it's done, but, you know, all it takes is a stroke of a pen. Yeah. There, yeah. There won't be another um, Laurie Strode. Right. Not in the person of Jamie Lee, but you, you never know what anybody might reimagine. Oh, yeah. That's what we say. And then Michael now is so big a character. He's, you know, he's like Frankenstein and Dracula, where – or Batman and Superman, where they're going to keep reinventing him over and over for every decade, for every generation. And and yes, now they're developing a, a TV series with Merrimax um, that um, they're saying is going to be tied to the next future feature film. Um, you know, it's an exciting time 
for us as fans because it, they could go anywhere with this. This franchise yeah. has had so many reboots and requels, and 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 it's a choose your own adventure franchise as it is. So they could really go anywhere or do something totally fresh and totally reimagine it again. Yeah, all the all the molecules from Michael after he got shredded, you know, they might all just magnetize back together. I think they will. Pure, pure yeah. evil, you know. It, it just changes shape. That guy's got so much dark energy, you know. Anything could happen. That's what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. And um, and I know you're going to be um, making other appearances and, and conventions and everything. And, and of course, when when you do get other uh, screen work, we we want to uh, hear about that. But you mentioned um, your onset cinema screening with our friend Kenny is coming up. Um, yeah. As we're as we're recording this, it's in a, in a few weeks, I think. Do you want to uh, plug uh, that next, appearance? Next Thursday, August uh, uh, April the fourth. Awesome. Yeah, at the Rusty Nail, which is the um, it's an old blues bar, but we filmed the whole uh, mob scene um, where everybody's up talking about the night of nineteen seventy eight, and they yep. get all worked up. And um, they, that's where the, the, the whole uh, impetus for the mob to go out and get Michael starts, you know, it starts at that bar and, and the, all the anger and the angst builds up and they leave there hell bent for leather. Yeah. So, and that's, uh, as I understand this, Kenny goes to places where, mm -hmm films were made or parts of films were made and does screenings there. So it works out really good that he's able to go to the rusty nail and do that. Yes. When, when we uh, went to Florida a few years ago on the way back, we did swing into Wilmington and that's one of the stops I had to make because it's, it's, they call it mixed bar in the film, but yeah, yeah. the rusty nail, we, we had to poke our head in there and get some footage in there while we were in town. Cause uh, yeah, that's a, that's a Haddonfield landmark now. Yeah, and uh, Kenny is going to do a um, a screening in his house, uh, I think, this summer. And uh, I think he's in, is he in uh, Hillsboro or Pittsburgh? Um, yeah, Hillsboro, Hillsboro, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, wants me to come down for that. So that'll be good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, have you been to his house yet, the Myers house in North Carolina? No, I haven't. No, no, I'm, You'll excited. I'm excited to see it. You'll love it, and I'll I'll love to hear your opinion of it, especially as somebody who actually constructed the Myers house for Halloween Kills. Here, you're going to see another um, replica of it. So I'll I'm sure myself and Kitty will be uh, interested in your opinion of it. But it's yeah. impressive. It'll be fun, yeah. And and more chances for fans to meet you, and I'm sure you'll be making other uh, convention appearances as well. I hope so. It's it's fun. Uh, as I say, the fans are um, so gracious and passionate and really kind and into the art form. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. They are. I mean, this this franchise, especially, it's, I always say it's like, you know, the best horror franchise and the best fans. They're the most passionate. Um, they're they're the most opinionated too, you know, and they'll let yeah. you hear about it. But they, it's it's all passion and and at those conventions, those those events especially, there's just nothing but love in those rooms, and, and that's yeah. that's what we love about it. And we just you know we feel it. And it's we're all crazy for this fictional serial killer that you know wears this mask and uh, and these other characters. But um, I, and I don't know why, but it is something magical in there. Yeah. Now, unlike anything else, that's for sure. <laughs> it is definitely unlike anything else. Yeah, I don't think there's another franchise, definitely not another horror franchise like Halloween that can can sustain itself like this with the fan base as passionate as they are. Yeah. Hey, I want to put a plug in for a podcast. Sure. Okay. Um, a couple of local guys here who were uh, film industry professionals from early on started a podcast called Rap Beer, W-R-A-P-B-E-E-B-E-E-R, -E 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 exclamation point. And it is, most episodes are about an hour long, and they've started 
They've interviewed people who are here on the ground floor at the beginning of the uh, studio and filmmaking in Wilmington. And it's an oral history of the the birth yeah. and the first few first few years of the, I mean, it's going to go into different eras, but right now it's the sort of the Dino era. And um, they've, they've uh, recorded 12 episodes and um, I'm, I'm in, I do episode five and episode seven, but it, all of them are really good. Uh, just full of great anecdotes behind the scenes uh, one of the guys was Dennis Hopper's driver during Blue Velvet. And awesome. so you can hear a lot of stuff about Dennis Hopper and Dean Stockwell and all the, all the uh, stuff that was going on behind the scenes. And, uh, and most of these people are, they're not, the people I've talked to so far are not actors. They are all uh, technicians or creative um, personnel in the, in the, in, in the industry so you get a ton of uh behind the scenes sort of ground floor real world uh background really interesting and, and funny yeah i will definitely have to check that out yeah yeah it's good it's a good time you know each as i said each episode's about an hour long but if you're driving along or you know doing whatever it's it's time well spent i think yeah, I'll check it out. And I'm always, I mean, people are fascinated to learn when I tell them how many movies, well-known movies, were shot here in North Carolina and in, in, in oh, yeah. Wilmington. Yeah. Um, I was I was thinking, though, I didn't see it on your IMDb, but did you uh, work on The Crow at all? I did not work on The Crow. Okay. No. I was, um, I was, you know, I was working on something else. I was going to say, probably on another, on another gig at that well, time. That's so funny. I mean, a lot of films have been made here, and, and I say, "Wow, I wish I'd worked on that film." But the good news is, I was working on something else, you know. So um, it's been, you know, it's been a rewarding career. Um, the the, you know, it's been ebb and flow for some years. Have been lean, and mm -hmm. um, then once the incentive, um, yeah, program started up. Um, I was working all over the place. I call it the incentive state comedy tour because you'd work, you know, you go to Louisiana, you go to Georgia. We went to Iowa for one show that had this massive tax credit. It only lasted for a year, but. Um, That's what it's all about for, for the, for to pull those productions in is the state's got to offer some kind of tax credit or something and, and sadly it is the uh it's all started in the early 90s with canada mm -hmm. they were the first ones to um to start the incentive um sort mm -hmm. of contest they went and then i'm not sure who went after that i know louisiana it took north carolina a while to get going and then georgia mm -hmm. when georgia jumped in it was a game changer because they were um they had a, a higher uh, tax credit and they did not limit the amount paid out um, with, with highly compensated actors. Oh, like yeah. North Carolina has a cap on how much can be uh, paid out on top of an actor's salary, but Georgia okay. did not. And you, if you have a, um, like a Robert Downey Jr. or someone like that that's getting eight or ten million dollars a film that adds up, obviously. Oh, yeah. In you know the aggregate part of it for producers, yeah. So it's tough. Uh, it's tough to compete with that. Some yeah. level playing field, but um, fortunately we do have stages here. We've got a very, very talented crew base, and um, yeah, it's not a bad place to work. Yeah, and it, it seems like there's there's still no shortage of work there these days. I mean, there's yeah. there's projects coming through. Um, I know you, about, uh, you know the the writers and the actors strike. Yeah, you know, shut everything down for probably seven or eight months. Yeah, <laughs> but there um, things are starting to percolate. You know, there's still a looming uh, Teamster and um, and I I is the um, union I'm in. Um, 
That's right. We're in, we're in contract negotiations now, but mm -hmm. there is always a fear that there would be a strike. So I don't think a lot Fingers of stuff, cross. I don't think a lot of stuff is going to uh, probably uh, really hit until after the uh, contract gets signed, which is hopefully sometime in uh, July. Oh. So it may be kind of slow until then, but I think a lot of people are uh, gearing up to get to get a lot of projects launched after that. Like you said, maybe right after the contracts are are signed, yeah. hopefully as then then they'll long be as, right as soon as they know there's not going to be a strike. I think it'll uh, things will take off. Yeah, after after last year, nobody wants to uh, jump the gun too soon with, like you said, a possible strike even looming. And everybody's strike weary right now. I'll tell you that. That's a good term. Yeah. Strike worry. I, yeah. I hear that. Well, this, this has been awesome. Um, talking to you and hanging out this evening. I mean, I, I could, I could go on. I know there's you've got tons of other awesome stories. Um, but, but I'll save some of those for another night and we can, we can talk sure. some and, more about some other projects because. And, and, ch and ch check out the podcast if you get a chance. I will. Those are um, those are great stories. Um, not just me, but everybody involved really had a lot to uh, do with the shaping of how things uh, came to be back yeah. in the day, which you know leads up to the way things are in, today. So yeah, it's good yeah. stuff. And I've known about you know a lot of those Dino projects and all, but to hear you tell it all from your perspective of, of being right there from, from the beginning. I think you've, you know, told us that history in a, in a pretty succinct way, but yeah, I'd love to hear more and I will check out that um, yeah. podcast. I mean, because being here in North Carolina, of course, I'm always curious and fascinated and, and excited that when I hear, you know, it was years ago, but I learned that trick or treat was filmed here and the crow was filmed here. And it's like, these are, you know, some of my favorite. And then when Halloween came here, it was like, Halloween, are you kidding me? Like, you know, so it, it's, yeah. it does have this um, very impressive history and, uh, oh, yeah. and, and hopefully future too. Yeah. Let's, let's keep it going. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we'll be here to talk about it. So like I said, we'll have you back on sometime and we'll Great. talk about some other stories from the set. I know you got plenty of them, but, um, but yeah, we've, We've been going for a while tonight, so um, so I'll I'll let you go for now. But yeah, this this has been awesome. I can't thank you enough for hanging out with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it again. All right. Absolutely. Well, you take care and uh, happy Easter. Happy Easter, and as we always like to say, because we hate to say goodbye anyway. And even though it is Easter weekend as we're recording this, every day is Halloween for us. So I always right. still like to say Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.